Dear Mr. Johnson, as international jurists, with an acute awareness of the responsibilities that our profession demand of us, we call on the British authorities to refuse the request for the extradition of Mr. Julian Assange to the United States. We also call for his immediate release. The treatment of Mr. Assange, the circumstances surrounding his continued detention in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison, and the circumstances surrounding British attempts to comply with the U.S. request for his extradition, highlight Number one, the involvement of the United Kingdom in long-term severe psychological ill-treatment of Mr. Assange. Number two, the disregard shown by the British authorities towards their duties and responsibilities under international law. Number three, the disregard by British authorities of British law, including Mr. Assange's right to a fair trial for the protection of his private life and his right to freedom of speech. Number four, the sweeping, extraordinary, extraterritorial claims now being made by the United States who are seeking to prosecute in the U.S. under U.S. laws non-U.S. citizens for conduct outside of the United States, including in jurisdictions such as the United Kingdom where that conduct is lawful. And note, UK involvement in the psychological torture and mistreatment of Mr. Assange, international human rights experts, healthcare professionals, and the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Professor Nils Melzer, have all found that Mr. Assange has been subjected to arbitrary confinement and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment amounting to torture. They note that the torture poses grave risks of significant physical, psychological, neuropsychological harm with life-changing and potentially fatal consequences for Mr. Assange. Professor Melzer has found the British state responsible for Mr. Assange's torture, quote, through perpetration or through attempt, complicity, or other forms of participation. This involvement of the British authorities in the psychological torture and mistreatment of Mr. Assange violates his rights under the European Convention for Human Rights, Article 3, and takes various forms, including the following. A. Interference in the Swedish investigations an inordinate protraction of Mr. Assange's detention. Mr. Assange originally sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, as was his right, because he was concerned that if extradited to Sweden, where he was being investigated in relation to now abandoned sexual assault allegations, he might be subjected to onward rendition from Sweden to the United States, for which there were precedents. Whilst physically present in the embassy, Mr. Assange offered to make himself available for interview by the Swedish authorities, whether in person or by video link, so as to facilitate the investigation of the sexual assault allegations. Mr. Assange also offered to go to Sweden, subject to an assurance from Swedish authorities that he would not be rendered to the United States. Information obtained under the Freedom of Information Act reveals that the Swedish authorities may have been minded to accept Mr. Assange's offers of interviews in the embassy or by video link. However, they were dissuaded from doing so by British authorities. The Crown Prosecution Services repeatedly urged Swedish authorities not to interview Mr. Assange in the United Kingdom and suggested that they insist instead on his extradition to Sweden. This compelled Mr. Assange to remain in the embassy for many years, despite the injury this was known to be causing to his health. Even the Stockholm Chief District Prosecutor has described the Swedish extradition effort, now known to have been urged on the Swedish authorities by the United Kingdom's Crown Prosecution Services as, quote, 
unreasonable and unprofessional, as well as unfair and disproportionate. Requests under the Freedom of Information Act show that the CPS specifically and repeatedly urged Swedish authorities to keep their investigation of Mr. Assange ongoing. In such missives, the CPS made extraordinary comments such as, quote, do not think this case is being treated as just another extradition, unquote, and, quote, don't you dare get cold feet, end of quote, discouraging the Swedish authorities from concluding their investigations. Mr. Assange was therefore unduly confined to the Ecuadorian embassy on the urging of the UK authorities, when in fact there were no charges to answer in Sweden. The United Kingdom therefore shares responsibility for the severe injury to the health that Mr. Assange suffered as a consequence of this protracted and unnecessary stay at the embassy and the consequent damage which the British authorities in part caused through their arbitrary, disproportionate, and illegal treatment of Mr. Assange. B. Denial of medical treatment whilst in the embassy. Assange had to endure debilitating and painful medical conditions in the embassy. These conditions included an excruciating tooth abscess and a serious injury to his shoulder, both of which remained untreated for several years. Mr. Assange was denied permission by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to leave the embassy to receive hospital treatment. This was despite a request from the Ecuadorian embassy to the British government for such access to be provided on medical grounds. C. Conditions of Mr. Assange's detention since his forced removal from the embassy and subsequent denial of proper medical treatment. Disregarding the well-established principle of proportionality, Mr. Assange, an award-winning journalist with complex health care needs, some of which are the result of the mistreatment he endured while forced to remain in the embassy, was given a custodial sentence of 50 weeks in the maximum security Belmarsh prison for the offense of skipping bail. This sentence was not only harsh and disproportionate in the circumstances, given Ecuador's granting of asylum and the findings of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, it was vindictive. The conditions in which Mr. Assange continues to be detained whilst on remand, also appear harsh, disproportionate, and vindictive. Mr. Assange poses no threat to the public. Given the significant breakdown in his health, he is not a flight risk. Yet the court, even before his lawyers had initiated any application for bail in the extradition proceedings, said that he would be remanded in custody because of his behavior in these proceedings. Yet, at the time, there had been no proceedings in the extradition case. He has been kept in custody in a maximum security prison, which the UN Special Rapporteur referred to as, quote, oppressive conditions of isolation involving at least 22 hours per day in a single occupancy cell. He is not allowed to socialize with other inmates and, when circulating in the prison, corridors are cleared and all other inmates are locked in their cells. Contrary to assurances by the prison administration and contrary to the general population of the prison, Mr. Assange reportedly still is not allowed to work or go to the gym where he could socialize with other inmates. End of quote. Visitors to Mr. Assange have reported that he was wearing a prison uniform despite only being a remand prisoner, that he is denied civilian clothes, and that his access to his prescription glasses was inexplicably delayed for months after they were sent to him at Belmarsh. Coming after nine years of arbitrary detention and illegal detention in the embassy, 
the harsh and disproportionate conditions in which Mr. Assange is being held have unsurprisingly caused further grave injury to his health. An international group of doctors have expressed serious concern for his present and future safety and well-being. They too have called for him to urgently receive appropriate treatment there. British authorities bear responsibility for the ongoing situation. Note number two, disregard for international law and infringement of Mr. Assange's rights as a refugee. Sweden, the United Kingdom, and Ecuador are parties to the convention relating to the status of refugees, which places on states an obligation to respect non-refoulement with no reservations. Not only have Mr. Assange's rights as a refugee been ignored, the UK authorities have helped undermine Mr. Assange's rights as an Ecuadorian citizen to protections under Ecuadorian law, such as a protection against extradition. In addition, UK authorities have not paid due regard to the clear findings of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, on the arbitrary detention of Mr. Assange. Importantly, the UK authorities have repeatedly ignored their duty to investigate the serious concerns raised by the UN Special Rapporteur, Professor Nils Melzer, in relation to prohibition against torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Note number three, disregard for Mr. Assange's right to a fair trial and for protection of his private life. Mr. Assange has suffered sustained infringement of his private life, whilst the conduct of the legal proceedings which have been brought against him has been riddled with procedural irregularities that call into question the possibility of a fair trial. A. Intrusive Surveillance It is now known that Mr. Assange and his visitors, including his lawyers, were put under extraordinary levels of covert surveillance within the Ecuadorian embassy at the behest of the United States. Evidence has now emerged to prove that this surveillance breached not just diplomatic sovereignty of the Ecuadorian embassy, but also Mr. Assange's human rights in respect of privacy and attorney-client privilege. It also intensified his torture. Professor Melzer notes, quote, Relentless surveillance for 24 hours a day is often used deliberately in psychological torture in order to drive victims into paranoia, except that the victim's perception actually corresponds to reality, end of quote. B. Destruction of evidence. When the actions of the British and Swedish authorities came to be scrutinized, via Freedom of Information Act requests and through other channels, it emerged that evidentiary trails, including communications with the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations, have been destroyed by Swedish and British prosecutors with no plausible explanation provided. C. Political Interference Senior UK governmental ministers have boasted about using their diplomatic skills and clout to broker a deal with Ecuador's new government to rescind Mr. Assange's asylum so that he could be taken into custody. D. The inability to prepare defense. Mr. Assange has been subjected to material and repeated disruptions, both with respect to his access to documents he needs in order to prepare his case and with respect to the facilities he needs in order to consult with his lawyers so that he can prepare for his defense. E. Concerns about impartiality. Officials responsible for key decisions about various aspects of Mr. Assange's case have made inappropriate comments about him, suggesting high levels of prejudice and bias. For example... Mr. Assange has been called a, a narcissist by a judge during a court hearing. There are also concerns that the senior judge who dealt with his previous case appears to have had serious multiple conflicts of interest. 
All this has led to doubts about whether an attempt to deny Mr. Assange a fair investigation of his case may be underway. F. Failure to respond to UN and other experts. UN officials have stated publicly that Mr. Assange has been detained illegally and arbitrarily and has been tortured. The British authorities have an obligation to engage with and to investigate these criticisms. Instead, the responses to UN officials have been belated, improper, and inadequate. Moreover, those responsible for these inadequate replies are those in the British government and the criminal justice system who are specifically responsible for ensuring that justice is served. Note number four, U.S. extraterritorial overreach and the dangers to Mr. Assange from extradition to the United States. The extradition request made by the U.S. authorities in itself gives rise to serious concerns. Mr. Assange is an Australian citizen and a journalist based in the United Kingdom. There is no suggestion that he has ever broken any British law whilst undertaking his work as a journalist in the United Kingdom. Mr. Assange, however, faces an extradition request from the United States in which U.S. authorities claim that he has committed offenses including under the U.S. Espionage Act, which applies exclusively to the jurisdiction of the United States. The charges that U.S. authorities are seeking to bring against Mr. Assange are seen by many journalists around the world as an open assault against investigative journalism as it is practiced. These demands by U.S. authorities for extradition to the United States of an Australian journalist based in the United Kingdom must inevitably give rise to serious concerns about the extraordinary extraterritorial demands which the U.S. authorities are now making. The consequences, if such demands are accepted by the U.K. to facilitate the extradition of a multi-award-winning journalist and publisher are a matter of great concern. There must also be serious concerns whether in the context of such demands Mr. Assange has any realistic prospect of a fair trial if he is extradited to the United States. This is especially concerning given the disproportionate, cruel, and inhuman punishment with which Mr. Assange is being threatened if he is convicted in the United States. His alleged accomplice and whistleblower Chelsea Manning, after already serving a lengthy prison term in often inhumane conditions, was held in indefinite detention in order to coerce her into giving evidence against Mr. Assange. Mr. Assange faces a possible prison sentence of 175 years. Extraditing Mr. Assange to the United States would, in such circumstances, not only be inhumane and wrong, it would set a dangerous precedent, legitimizing the U.S. authorities' practice of extraterritorial overreach whilst infringing Mr. Assange's human rights in the most fundamental way, putting his very life at risk. It would also set the scene for a trial whose eventual outcome might set extraordinary dangerous precedents which could endanger the entire practice of journalism. In conclusion, under the rule of law, a state is required to afford all defendants the human rights and to honor international law, whether deriving from treaty or from international custom and practice. Such considerations are not intended to be optional or dependent on the nature of the crime nor are they justified by the nature of the circumstances, nor are they implemented at the discretion of the judge or state. As Lord Bingham eloquently reminds jurists in his eponymous 2006 lecture on the subject, the constitutional practice of the rule of law is statutory and paramount. Yet, time and time again in Mr. Assange's case, we have seen the law ignored, manipulated, or summarily rejected. We call on the British legal community to reclaim 
professional standards to condemn the torture of Mr. Assange and to engage in urgent actions to secure his immediate and safe release.